about addicts, you know, we're not just there to help addicts, we are addicts. Um, and every time I hear her say that, I think about our church because we're not just here to minister to bikers, we are bikers. Uh, it's not a biker-friendly church, it's not a church where we say, hey, let's go help them, or let's go spread the love of Christ to them. Um, we are bikers filled with the love of Christ that just want to share with our community. Um, we're, we are the bikers. Um, my story, as long as I can remember, I've loved motorcycles. I don't even remember when I started loving motorcycles. It was that, that soon of a thing for me. Um, I don't have some hard luck story. In fact, uh, a lot of the, my passion for motorcycles comes from uh, a very loving, caring um, father who loved to ride motorcycles. Um, and my dad uh, started out on dirt bikes as, as when I was very young. Uh, again, I can't really remember a time he didn't, didn't ride uh, dirt bikes. Um, I just, just remember that he did. And it was so cool, you know, that uh, to see him on these bikes and we would go to hill climbs and we would go to flat track races and, um, and you know, I was, I was really little, could hardly remember, but uh, we'd pile into these van, this van. I don't even know who owned the van, but they'd pile all these old uh, dirt bikes. And, um, and you know, these guys, they, they wrenched on all their own stuff. You know, I mean, they weren't rich. My dad was a, a blue collar guy, a steel worker. Um, or, and, um, you know, he, my dad's still around. Thank God. I'm, 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 uh, you know, I'm blessed to have him. Um, well, he's retired now, but he was a steel worker, blue collar guy. Uh, didn't have a lot of extra money, bought an old bike, and they wrenched on these bikes, and then they went out on the weekends and they rode, and um, uh, it, we would just pile in this van, and we'd go wherever we were going. My mom would be working, so there wasn't any babysitter, so I just went along, you know, and it was just, uh, it was just cool, very cool. Um, sometimes he'd go out by himself, um, and I remember we had this little club basement that he built down in our little row house, and he'd come in from riding, and uh, you could, I could tell he was in some great discomfort. And, uh, you know, usually he'd be kind of cussing and carrying on. But anyway, he, he, I could just tell he wasn't, that something had happened. And I said, well, what happened, Dad? And he said, uh, well, I fell off my bike and somebody rode over me. And he literally, he took his shirt off and he had a tire track up his back. And in my young, warped mind, that was cool. <laughs> I said, wow, that is really cool, Dad. Somebody, well, you know, he didn't think so at the time. But, but, um, but you know, I just always had this uh, fascination. Now, you know, he didn't ride the whole time I was growing up, but he, he rode on and off and on and off. And... Um, uh, he had the dirt bike and then he had a little street bike and um, he was into it for a while and then he got out of it and uh, there were years that he didn't ride. Me, I always, man, it was in my mind, I, I wanted to ride. Uh, when I was 16, um, my wife, uh, her, we were going out at the time, um, her dad had this little uh, two-gear, it was a moped but it looked like a little motorcycle. Um, and he was selling it, so I bought it, you know, and this was uh, my transportation because it was cool, you know, and her and I rode around on it. We were uh, younger and much smaller then. <laughs> but it did, it had two gears and it had pedals, so it was a moped, but you couldn't pedal it because it was too big and heavy to pedal. So what the pedal was there for is you'd throw it in neutral and you would kickstart it with the pedal. And so it was kind of cool, you know. And, throw it neutral and, you know, ride all around. Um, uh, I remember getting pulled over on it and, uh, you know, I had to convince the cop that this was a moped. <laughs> but um, but we, we just rode and rode and um, I went in a service. I didn't have a bike then, but when I got out of service and we first got married, we had one car and I bought a motorcycle basically for transportation because we worked different hours and it was really tough to coordinate with one car we really couldn't afford to buy another car, so I bought a, a small bike, and uh, that was my transportation back and forth to work. And um, uh, but we rode a lot on the weekends because we just we just loved it, you know, and we just loved getting out on it. And uh, eventually, my dad bought a Sportster, so 
Um, of course, I had to go out and buy a Sportster as well because couldn't let Dad ride around with a guy on a, um, well, I won't say what it was. <laughs> But me and Dad got to ride around on our bikes, and, and you know, it was, it's, it's awesome for me to be able to say that, you know, to say that we, we rode. Because I know, man, let, you know, let me just put this out there, and I didn't realize this until uh, we were in some men's groups and so forth, and people kind of shared their hearts. There's a lot of people out there that don't have good relationships with their dad. There's a lot of people out there that didn't necessarily have great fathers. Uh, I was blessed. I didn't know it. You know, of course, it's like most things, you don't appreciate it until later on, but uh, it was, it's great to have a dad like that. And it was great that we got to ride and spend time together like that. Very cool. Hey, Artie, can you uh, pull that picture up? Not this picture. <laughs> you guys recognize this guy? Evil Knievel, yeah. Um, my, besides my dad as a hero, this was, this was one of my early heroes, Evil Knievel. Um, I remember watching the movie. Do you guys remember who played Evil Knievel in the movie? George Hamilton. Um, and, you know, it wasn't a very good movie <laughs> as far as movies go, but, but I thought it was awesome, right? I mean, because here's this guy that... You've, Rode motorcycles, jumped cars, I mean, was, was fearless, right? Was uh, just everything that, that I just thought I wanted to be, right? This uh, daredevil kind of guy. And, um, you know, the really cool thing is, um, so back in 97, uh, Jackie and I went to uh, Bike Week down in Myrtle Beach. And I always watched all Evil's jumps, and then uh, Robbie came along, and he was jumping, and I always watched all Robbie's jumps, too, Robbie Knievel or... Captain Robbie Knievel, as they call him, or whatever. Uh, but I watched him do his jumps, and um, he did this jump over some buses, something his dad had done. But before the jump, here comes Evil Knievel on this motorcycle that California Motorcycle Company had built. Uh, and he rides up on the ramp, you know, to, like, to, to uh, um, introduce the jump or whatever. And... Uh, uh, we're down in Myrtle Beach, and here's California Motorcycle Company, and here's this motorcycle sitting here that I had seen on TV, and I'm all excited. You know, I'm like, wow, there's that motorcycle that Evil Knievel was on. And the guy was like, well, it's not really the one he was on, but it's one of 500. So, and, and he says, uh, he's going to be here tomorrow. And I'm like, who's going to be here tomorrow? And, he's, and he says, bless you, he says, Evil Knievel. Well, I'm like a kid, you know, I'm like, really? Evil Knievel's coming? You know, so here we are, we're down at Bike Week, Myrtle Beach, and I'm driving my friends crazy because, I'm, you know, I, I, every half hour or so, I'm like, we got to be there when Evil Knievel gets there, you know, like, so I was making sure that in that, that morning, we left in time to get down there so I could stand in line and, and meet Evil Knievel. And, and then I get in this line, and there's all these clones of me standing in this line, right? And we're all talking about Evil Knievel, you know, like, oh yeah, he was great, and this and that. I mean, except for like the Snake River thing, but I mean, but all the other stuff. And, and you know, we were just excited to meet him. And, you know, <laughs> he was so, it's not funny, but it is. He was so busted up that they literally like had a guy on each side to walk him up and he was standing on a little, you know, sitting on this little bench and uh, just sit and sign an autographs, but, uh, and he looked so old, but when I walked up to meet him and shake his hand, he had a grip like you wouldn't believe, and I mean, because he looked so frail, it was, it was shocking, and you looked in his face, and he looked exactly like, you know, you, I always pictured him looking um, in the face, but anyway, it was, it was cool to meet him and shake his hand, and, um, um, but it was just part of my whole childhood and part of this whole fascination with bikers. I grew up in a neighborhood, um, and Jackie could attest to this, we grew up in the same area, and there were a lot of bikers, and there was, there weren't a lot of clubs back then. I mean, we have, there's a lot of clubs now uh, compared to back then. There were only a few, and they were um, mostly like um, outlaw 1% clubs, and we had a clubhouse right in our neighborhood, and, um, and there was, uh, um, everybody rode these old Harleys before the big Harley craze, before everybody wanted to have Harley, before 
what we used to call the Rolex riders, right? We used to call these guys the Rolex riders. They went out and they spent a whole bunch of money on a motorcycle and then they spent ten or twenty thousand dollars putting accessories on it so it looked cool and then they put about five hundred miles on it and then they over a five year period and, and then they sold it, right? Because they were tired tired of riding. Um, but no, these were guys that they were into it. Again, they wrenched their own bikes. Um, there were all spots where the bikes used to sit. I mean, this, this was back in the day. And, uh, but these guys were, we looked up to these guys. You know, these guys were, they were cool. They were, again, um, um, these blue collar, um, hard working, hard playing type of guys. And, you know, I think the thing that really, I did this, um, I had a mentor at our, at our old church, and he did this thing with me, and he, they called it a, a spiritual direction. And I kind of mapped out my whole life and all these events, and I put in the significance of the events. And when it was all done and over with, there were a lot of big events, like my, my wife and I getting married and our, our, our uh, son being born and, uh, you know, graduations and all that. But intertwined in all this stuff was all this bike stuff. You know, because that was my life. I mean, I, I really spent a lot of time and, and effort and, and just, it's just what I like to do. Um, and I always thought it was about the bikes, but what this made me realize was, uh, as I studied and I looked through it, it wasn't, it wasn't the bike as much as the bikers. I, I, you know, I am and I love these people, right? Because here were people that, here are people that they're very loyal they're brothers and they're sisters. Um, they're very loyal to one another. They they watch each other's backs. They're they're tough. You know they they it's tough to ride a bike uh, all the time. Uh, but you got to really love to do it. You got to really have a passion for it. Again, I've known many many people who have bought this motorcycle and you know it was going to be the coolest greatest thing that ever happened to them. And then in a year or two they're they're out of it again because you got to really have a passion for it. Um, they were people that uh, uh, loved each other. They're people much like Christians. Um, they, had, they do a lot of the same things. They, it's the group of people, men, who hug and kiss each other. They're the only m group of men that I knew that they would tell each other they loved each other. Um, they, were, uh, um, they traveled in pairs. You know, Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs, and I thought it was uh, really ironic. One of the uh, um, hardcore clubs that I knew, the guys that were in it, they actually traveled in pairs. They emulated what Christ did 2,000 years ago. Maybe not consciously, but, but, but they did. And, you know, they even went as far as in this club, they would tattoo the person's name that they were... Like when they, when they patched in, they had a partner and they tattooed that guy's name on their arm. And those guys were, were um, um, charged with looking out for each other. That's, that's what they do. They look out for each other. And I admired, admired that and admire that um, because really as Christians, that's what, that's what it's all about, right? We're this family and we're brothers and sisters and we look out for each other. Um, the only thing um, they're missing in, is Jesus. Uh, so, you know, to start a biker church here and get a group of bikers together and get them fired up about Jesus Christ, I think that's powerful, man. And I think that's why God loves this community and I think that's why God has put this vision with, uh, with myself and our core team to plant this church here in York. And that's why there's all these churches planted down south. Because there's a powerful group of people here that don't know Jesus and don't really know what it's all about to, uh, to live for and love Jesus. Don't really know what it's all about to have Jesus fulfill their life purpose. Um, and, but once they do, man, that kind of person is going to be uh, powerful in the, in the kingdom. Um, now there's some unique issues with having a biker church and you know I think a, a large amount of those issues ironically come from the religious community 
it ain't the other bikers that, that are going to criticize us the most. It's the religious people who have an idea of what church is supposed to be about and, um, you know, and, and are really uh, tied up and tangled up in the legal, legalistic uh, laws and rules that go along with, with church uh, um, as it's perceived. Um, as you know, the video says, we're not here to give you a holier-than-thou attitude. We're not here to, to uh, 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 minister to bikers. We are bikers. I understand, you know, when a person says, hey, I've been out, we were out partying last night. Yeah, I, I was there. I have the T-shirt, for sure. Um, we, um, we want to be here to create that environment that, that you're comfortable when you come in. Uh, and, th- and when you're comfortable, then you will get to know Jesus. And when you do get to know Jesus, he will fulfill that purpose in your life. Um, I got like, I get, I get, get, I got really fired up last night about a few things. Um, and this is how I get really fired up. I sit on the back porch and um, talk to God and he brings me scriptures and, you know, and, and, and gives me, uh, speaks to me. Gives me revelations, talk, talks to me about certain things. Um, one of the things I did when I, I uh, was riding, you know, I, I, I got my bike, uh, got out of the Navy, got a, got a bike, uh, and uh, immediately, you know, I started hitting the lifestyle. I wanted to uh, party and ride this motorcycle. And, you know, one of the things that's kind of crazy is I didn't have any problem drinking and riding my motorcycle. You know, the, the laws were getting really strict and all that kind of thing. So mostly what I was worried about was getting caught, was, uh, you know, getting locked up. I wasn't really worried about killing somebody else or killing myself. I was mostly just worried about getting caught. And I would, uh, uh, so I would avoid driving in my car. And this is how I thought it was just messed up. But I would avoid driving in my car because I figured it was easier to get caught, to get pulled over when I was driving in the car. And I felt like when I was on a motorcycle, they didn't really get pulled over that much. And that's probably true. I mean, because unless you're really, you know, falling off your bike or something, I've, it was rare that I would know anybody got pulled over on a motorcycle. So, you know, I felt like it was really... It's okay to drink and ride my motorcycle, right? Because I probably won't get caught on that, right? So that's kind of my messed up thinking. And, and really, when, we, uh, when we're out, you know, a biker being outside of Jesus, that's where I was. My, your, your thinking, my thinking was uh, messed up uh, because I didn't have the wisdom of God. I didn't have the enlightenment of Jesus, you know, because the Bible says... Um, says that there's, uh, uh, once you're saved, you, you're enlightened. Uh, John 1.9 uh, reads, There was a true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So what, what that's really saying is when you cross that line of faith, you're enlightened. In other words, you, it's the beginning of wisdom. And you can be very smart and not very wise. Have you ever known anybody like that? Really intelligent, but my grandfather would say they had no common sense. Very smart, but no common sense. Um, what uh, um, salvation brings to you, the first thing that the, the Bible tells us is enlightenment and uh, wisdom. So, you know, immediately after I was saved, I realized how messed up my thinking had been. And, you know, again, it, it, it allowed me not only to think about myself and my selfish need to not get pulled over and not get locked up, but it, it, it helped me to understand that I could kill somebody. I could kill myself. Um, the, I could do something that would change my life and someone else's life forever. And, uh, it, and I hadn't even thought about that before. Uh, it says at the end of that verse, with salvation comes wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1.30 uh, says, It's because of him 
that you are in Jesus Christ, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Again, reemphasizing the fact that with uh, Jesus comes wisdom, with our salvation comes wisdom. Uh, immediately after crossing the line of faith, what I noticed was I started uh, understanding things I never understood before. And some of the things that I thought were really silly or that I would discount, mostly because it interfered with my lifestyle, right? I mean, that's really why we do it, because it kind of interferes with what we want to do. I, I uh, immediately realized that um, I, I just understood things that I never understood before. Um, so back to the challenges we, we, we face. So we want to gather, grow, and go. That's what our uh, what Freedom Biker Church is all about. We get together here, we learn, we disciple, and then we go out. Because really, this is, this is church on Sunday, but the church is really out there, folks, because a lot of people aren't going to come in here. A lot of people will never darken our doors. But they need to hear about Jesus. They, they have a need for God. And they're not going to hear about it if we don't go. And I'm not talking about just, you know, um, out into a community fair. I'm talking about into the bars, into the events. Now, look, I understand not everybody can go into a bar. There are people here that have had a lot of trouble with drinking and that kind of thing, and it, it's, it's just it's too difficult. But there are places that you can go that people have never heard about or don't regularly hear about Jesus. That's our vision here. But in doing that, you know, I say that, even saying that, I want to go into a bar is going to raise the hair on the back of some pastors and preachers and religious people. Because they, they'll say, you know, you don't, you don't belong in a bar. And they, you know, and they, in good intention, they quote Paul, because Paul talks about um, staying away from immoral people and so forth. But what they don't realize is Paul is not talking about worldly people people that aren't saved. He's talking about people in the church. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 12 says, this is after he, he had talked about staying away from immoral people and the church was kind of saying, well, you know, we got we to gotta kind of build these walls so that we, uh, we don't get affected by all this. Uh, but what he says is not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters in that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an adulterer or slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. So what he's talking about are people, myself, a preacher who you know, stands up on Sunday and preaches the word. We, we all know him, right? I mean, I pray to God that I never am one, right? But the temptations of the world are out there, and I've seen great preachers fall. But they preach the word, and then they go and do something else. And uh, these are the people that we're not to associate with because you can't love Jesus, uh, obey Jesus, um, have Jesus in your heart if all you're doing is talking about him. If you're not, if you, if you're not live, who can respect a person that tells you one thing and lives another way? It doesn't matter what, I'm Christian or otherwise. Who could respect a biker who says, I got your back, and then when, when, when things get tough, they're out the back door. You're going to respect that guy. I'm not. But this is, what, this is what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about the world. He's not saying stay away from the world. Jesus told us to go into the world and preach the gospel. So Paul's certainly not contradicting Jesus here. right? He's saying watch the wolves in your own family. Watch the people that will uh, tell you one thing and do exactly the other. Um, 
So uh, in 1 Corinthians 19 through 13, uh, Paul talks about his uh, use of freedom. So Paul says, and it's amazing, like, we, so we open Freedom Biker Church, right? And you say, well, Freedom, that's really, hey, that's a cool name. But not only is it a cool name, when you read the Bible, you're going to see the word freedom all throughout. Because that's what God really promises us. We, we perceive it from the worldly point of view as bondage because, you know, we think about all the rules and, the, and, and this and that. But what, what Jesus did when he died on the cross is he freed us from our sins. He freed us from all these things that oppress us. He freed us from the things that even the things we think are good, but in the end... Uh, they lead us to bad places. But Paul knows he's free, and he's guilt-free, but this is what he says. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but un I am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that all pos by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. There's a lot of stuff in there. But basically, you know, what Paul is saying is I, I'm not bound by laws anymore, but I am bound to Christ. So, you know, in this church, it's not all about going out and straightening, every, straightening out the world. It's about inviting people to a place where they can be comfortable and they can hear about the one who can save them. Because laws aren't going to save you. If you read, if you read uh, uh, Paul, Paul in Romans, he'll tell you that. The law can't save you. You can't obey enough rules to be saved. You can't, you can't in your own will be close enough to God to become saved. That's why Jesus died on the cross. That's why he spilled his blood, so that we could have the gift of salvation. No requirements, except to accept that gift from Jesus, to accept Jesus as your Savior. And when you do, you will come to know Jesus. And God will speak to you and God will be with you. He promises and it's true and I, again and I'll, and I'll always tell you guys this experience has shown me that as much as the word of God as much as talking to God. So in the end that's what, that's what we're all about here. We love bikers we love bikes. I hope you under, have a better understanding of, of why I love bikers and love bikes. Um and, um, but here it's, it's all about Jesus, right? It's printed on the wall over there. Uh, again, reminds me so as much as it reminds you guys. Um, so, you know, I want to say to you guys, and I, and I, and I, I, this is always an open offer here. If you do not know Jesus as your personal savior, this is your day of salvation. It's not hard it's easy, it, it, it's, it's the walk, you know, it, we're not promising you anything easy, but it, it's easy to accept Christ as your Savior. Uh, it, it's easy to find salvation, and this could be your day. So if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, and you want to know Jesus as your personal Savior, or maybe you just have some questions, please take some time while we're hanging out to talk to somebody here that knows and loves Jesus. And if you're so inclined and you, you cross that line of salvation, let us know. Let somebody know. We have a bell here we like to ring so um, to celebrate because the Bible says heaven is celebrating when one, when one person is saved. Um, 
So uh, if, if you will, I'm going to uh, end this up in prayer. So join me in prayer, please. Lord Jesus, uh, we just thank you. We uh, thank you for your word. We thank you for your message. We uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, we thank you for dying on the cross and spilling your blood in order to save us, Lord. We thank you that you love this community, that you love the bikers, Lord, that, that are not only here in this church, but are out there wherever they would be, in the bars and in the, in the uh, rallies and in the clubhouses all over York and all over the world. And Lord, just pray for them, Lord, that they would really come to know you, who you really are, not who they perceived you to be or who the media tells them that you are, but to know you. Because, Lord, I know when they know you, they will love you and they will feel your love, Lord. And I pray that anybody that um, doesn't know you, that isn't saved, that they would, uh, that you would touch their heart and, and um, uh, just that the Holy Spirit would just grab hold of them and, um, and give them some clarity and help them to uh, understand, Lord. That you're not that you're here to uh, to save us, and uh, Lord, we just pray for safety today, for uh, safe travel, uh, Lord. That we just pray for people to be safe in all this heat, Lord. It's so hot, and uh, but uh, we but we thank you that it's a, it's a sunny day and a and a, a decent day to ride, Lord. And uh, Lord, we'll just be careful in everything that we do to give you all the uh, praise and glory. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said. No doubt.